Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Abdullah Stienkam, and my co-presenter for this evening uh, will be Tom Mokarosi. The format for tonight's lecture will be as follows. Um, I will kick off with uh, the revision questions of Monday evening. I will then cover laws 33 and 35, and Tom will then cover laws 37, 38, and 39, and then he will also deal with the revision questions, and afterwards we will open the floor for Q&A. So the first question we handled on, the revision question we handled on Monday evening was, the opening bowler Paul pulls up with a groin injury at 10.48 in a provincial game. He only leaves the field at 10.50. There's a scheduled drinks break from 11.10 till 11.14. Paul then comes back onto the field at 11.40. Lunch is taken at 12.20. And after lunch, the captain tosses the ball to Paul to bowl the first over after lunch. What actions will you take, if any? So when it comes to working out penalty time, the best method to do this is to break it up into smaller pieces, to break up, to break it up and work out the penalty time every time there is a break in play, whether it's an interval or whether uh, it's a rain interruption. So firstly, the first thing we need to cover is when does the penalty time start? Does it start from 10.48 or from 10.50? It starts from the time that Paul left the field, which is at 10.50. The two minutes from 10.48 till 10.50 will be taken as extenuating circumstances and, um, and it will be used to calculate the overrate for the fielding side. So Paul left at 10.50. So I said you um, the best is to cut this in smaller pieces and work till whether it's an interval or a rain interruption. So he left the field at 10.50 and there was a drinks break at 11.10. So there's your first interval. Drinks break is a scheduled interval. So from 10 to 10 till 11.10, that is 20 minutes. So at the start of the drinks break, Paul owes us 20 minutes. We know that a drinks break or any scheduled interval does not count for or against the fielder, so you won't add it uh, to the fielder's penalty time, nor will you subtract it from the fielder's uh, penalty time. So then after the drinks break at 11.14, the fielder's Paul's penalty time will then start again. He only comes back onto the field at 11.40. So now at 11, from 11.14 till 11.40 is 26 minutes. So now, before the drinks break, Paul owed us 20 minutes. F from after the drinks break at 11.14 till 11.40, that's a further 26 minutes. So when Paul returned to the field of play at 11.40, he owes us 46 minutes in total. Uh, how did I get to 46? I added the 26 and the, the 20. That's how I get to 46. So um, as Paul... Um, comes onto the field with either of the umpire's uh, permission. The first thing is you calculate the penalty time, which we just did, 46 minutes. We now need to inform Paul that he's been off for 46 minutes and we need to tell him when he is allowed to bowl again and also inform his, the, the fielding uh, captain. So 11.40 owes us 46 minutes. Lunch gets taken at 12.20. So again, that's the drinks break. As the players walk, 
of the field of play? You ask yourself, is there any fielders off for penalty, uh, for, um, yeah, for, or for an injury? Yes. If the answer is yes, you need to calculate penalty time. So it was just 46 minutes at 11.40. At 12.20, at Paul was on the field for 40 minutes. How did I get 40 minutes? From 11.40 till 12.20 is 40 minutes. So the one uh, method that your penalty time will be will reduce is if if you are on the field fielding. That's one method of reducing your penalty time. The other method is if there's an unscheduled break. In this um, in this question, Paul was on the field, so his penalty time, his total penalty time, needs to reduce by the 40 minutes. So at the start of lunch, Paul owes us 40 minutes. As, um, Paul owes us six minutes. How did I get to six? I took the 46 minutes and I, I subtracted the 40 minutes of playing time that Paul was on the field. Lunch is finished 40 minutes later at one o'clock as the players walks onto the field and if Paul is one of them, you inform Paul and he, uh, the fielding captain that Paul still owes us uh, six minutes and Paul can bowl again at 13.06. Let's just go through the, the answer. So you only, Paul's penalty time will start from 10.50. The two minutes will be taken as extenuating. So Paul left at 10.50 and returned at 11.40 and and that's 50 minutes in total off. There was a drinks break of four minutes. And if you take off the drinks break, 50 minus four, you get to 46 minutes when he returns to the field of play. This is just another method of, uh, of doing the calculation. Um, I prefer to break it up into smaller pieces. One, if there's an interval, calculate the penalty time. If there's... Um, uh, interruption, you also then calculate the penalty time. Once the fielder returns, you calculate the penalty time. That, that's, uh, these are the two myth methods of calculating the penalty time. So lunch was from 12.20 till 1 o'clock. Paul was on the field from 11.40 till 12.20, 40 minutes. You can then take off the 40 minutes from the 46 minutes that he owes us. So at the start of lunchtime, Paul owes us 6 minutes. And Paul can then bowl again at 13.06. Another penalty time question. Again, method is break it up into smaller pieces. John pulls a hammy at 3 o'clock and leaves the field. T is at 15.20. So, as I said, when there's a, a break or there's an interruption, you calculate the penalty time that the fielder owes us at the start of the break or at the start of the interruption. So, T was at 15.20. So, as you walk off, of, off the field, you ask yourself, are there any fielders off? Yes, in this case, John is off. How much penalty time does John owe us at the start of the, of the T break? So he went off at 1500, T was at 1520. So at the start of T, John owes us 20 minutes. How long is T? 20 minutes. Upon um, the players return off the T, so at 1540, the players will be on the field and play will restart. Was John on the field at 1540? No, he was not on the field at 1540. So as soon as play starts, John's penalty time will now continue because he's not on the field of play. John only returned at 15.50. So play started at 15.40 after T. John only returned at 15.50. So that's a further 10 minutes that John was not on the field of play. So that 10 minutes, you need to add to the penalty time that John already owes us. So in total, when John returned to the field of play, you, um, John owes us 
20, uh, 30 minutes, the 20 before T and the 10 minutes after T. So as John returns, you tell um, him, as well as his fielding, uh, the fielding captain, that he owes us 30 minutes and you, you can calculate the time that he, that he can bowl. So at 16.10, the batting captain declares. So the play then continued for a further 20 minutes. We now know that uh, time on the field, uh, the, the uh, injured fielder can offset it from the penalty time that he owes. So at the declaration at 16.10, John was on the field for 20 minutes. So now we know John owed us 30 minutes when he came on. He was on the field for further 20 minutes when the captain declared. So you can offset that 20 minutes from the 30 that he owes us. So at the start of the declaration, or at 16.10, John owes us 10 minutes. And the change of innings interval is 10 minutes. It's a scheduled interval. So that time will not count for John, nor against him. So the Team B will come out to bat at 16.20. How much penalty time does uh, John owe us? 10 minutes. So if the of Team B's innings is starting at 16.20, you need to tell the batting captain that John can only bat at 16.30 or if five wickets are down. So just to summarize in writing what I just said, T interval, he owes us 20 minutes. So T is from 15.20 till 15.40. So this will not count for John or against him. But I said, remember, John only returned at 15.50, while the rest of the team returned at 15.40 after T. So that's a further 10 minutes that he was off. So you need to add that 10 minutes to the 20 that he already owes us before T. So he owes us 30 minutes in total when he returns at 15.50. So this was a declaration at 16.10, scheduled interval from 16.10 till 16.20. So at 16.10, John was on the field for 20 minutes. So he owes us 10 minutes at the start of the change of innings interval. That's how did I get to 10? I took the 30 that he owes us and I took off the 20 that he was on the field. So when play I play restart at 16.20, John owes us still 10 minutes, so he can only bat at 16.30 or if five wickets are down, whichever is the earlier. Last of the revision questions, the striker hits the third ball of the over to fine leg and starts running. The batters complete three runs and as they turn for the fourth, a fielder that return to the field without permission, touch the ball. The fielder then throws the ball to the keeper just as the batters complete their fourth run. What actions will you take, if any? So the best uh, method to answer this again is to break it up into smaller pieces and to, to visualize this. That's the best method to answer this. So if a player comes back onto the field without the, the umpire's permission, the, and as soon as that player touches the ball, the ball immediately becomes dead. The umpire shall then award five penalty runs to the batting side. Runs completed by the batters, together with the run in progress, shall be scored if they had crossed at the instant of the offense. The penalty for no ball or wide shall Stand if it's applicable. The ball shall not count as one for the over. The umpires shall then need to inform everyone and also report the incident. So how many runs in for this scenario? The batters completed three runs, and because they did not cross yet when the ball become come dead, they only get the three runs. So in total, they'll get eight five for the penalty runs, and three for the completed runs. Since the batters did not cross when the ball became dead, the non-striker needs to face. 
because the ball doesn't count as one for the over, there are three more balls remaining in the over. And good umpiring technique, um, just to make sure at, at the next interval, write down the time over and the ball, and you can just double check with the scorers that they've recorded that particular ball correctly. The law 33, I'm going to start off by showing you a video. Abdullah, I'm not hearing any sound coming through. Uh, uh, copy that, Tom. Just give me, just give me a second. Fair catch. A catch shall be considered fair if the ball is held in a fielder's hand, hugged to the body of the catcher, or accidentally lodges in his or her clothing, helmet, or protective equipment. But of course, this being cricket, it isn't always that simple. If a fielder deliberately uses an item of clothing to try to catch the ball, it is not out and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. However, the ball can be caught after it has deflected off the other batsman, an umpire, another fielder, including off a helmet being worn, or even if it lodges in a fielder's helmet. Perhaps the main criterion for a catch to be considered fair is that the ball must not touch the ground before being caught. Here, for example, the ball does not touch the ground even though the hand holding it does so in affecting the catch. This is a fair catch. And then there is the question of catches near the boundary. This is such an interesting subject that we've given it a film all of its own. To catch up on everything to do with catching, simply refer to Law 33 in the Blue Book. So if a striker gets this miss caught, how many runs will be scored? No runs to be scored from that delivery. But any runs for penalties awarded to either side shall stand. Court will always take priority over any other mode of dismissal except bowl. So bowl takes priority over any other dismissal, mode of dismissal. Secondly, court will take priority over any other dismissal, except for bold. Hit wicket. So how can you be dismissed hit wicket? There are two conditions that needs to be met before you can be given out each wicket. The first condition is the bowler, it needs to happen after the bowler entered the delivery stride and the ball and while the ball is in play. So these two conditions needs to be in place. The bow, it needs to be after the bowler has entered his delivery stride and while the ball is in play. And then if these two conditions are met, the wicket is then put down by, the, by either the striker's bat or by the striker's person in any of the following circumstances. So just to summarize point number one, for a striker to be given out the wicket, two conditions needs to be met. 
the bowler has to enter his delivery stride. And when does the delivery stride uh, start? It starts from the moment that the bowler's back foot lands. So if you can visualize a bowler running in and bowler being in, in his or her gather and then jumping up and the moment the back foot lands, that is when the delivery stride starts, or that is when the bowler has entered his or her delivery stride. So that's the one condition, and the other one is the ball while the ball is still in play. So if these, if these two conditions are met, and then the wicket is then put down by either the striker's bat or by his person in any of the following circumstances. Firstly, the striker will be out yet wicket, but if in the course of any action taken by the striker in preparing to receive or in receiving a delivery. So any action that the striker takes while he's going to face that particular delivery, and, and what, are, what are examples of any action? Examples are uh, some, some strikers go uh, have a trigger movement uh, by moving back and across. If you can visualize the striker, uh, just visualize striker moving back and across. So that is an example of an action that a striker is taking in preparing for delivery. Another example of an action is um, and I used to this, do this in my playing days. I, I lifted my bat up as the bowler was about to deliver. I lifted my, my back, bat up like, like a back lift. That is another example of an action that the striker uh, takes in preparing to receive uh, the delivery. Another method of how the striker can be out hit wicket is if the striker in setting off for the first run, and the important word in, in, in point number two is it needs to happen immediately after playing at the ball. So if you can visualize the striker setting off for the first run immediately after playing or playing at the ball. So as soon as the striker is played at the ball, the striker sets off immediately. And the, the important word here is immediately. And if the striker then did it immediately and the striker puts the wicker down by either the bat or the person, the striker shall be given out it wicket. Point three is similar to point number two. Uh, just in point number two, the striker plays a shot and then immediately set off. Point three is the striker does not uh, play a shot, but but um, the striker then still sets off um, to take a run. But the important part in point number three, as in point number two, is it needs to happen immediately. The striker needs to run immediately. If there is a pause um, in the striker setting off for a run, if there is a delay and then the striker puts the wicker down, the striker will be not out. So the important thing that I want you to take away from point two and point three is it need for if the striker sets off for a run, uh, whether it's whether the striker played at the ball or if the striker didn't play at the ball, in setting off for that run, it needs to happen immediately. If there is a pause or um, or um, there's a de slight delay, the striker shall not be out hit wicket, even if the striker puts the wicket down with his bat or his person. Uh, yeah, typical example of, 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 of point two and three is if you can visualize this, this the striker playing at the ball, and then setting off the back foot slips. And with the back foot slipping, it then goes against the, wick, the wicket and, and puts the wicket down. That's a typical example of point two and three. So now the important thing here, as I said, is immediately 
So at the moment there's a pause, and I'll give an example of 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 a pause. So I'll first I'll first uh, I'll give you um, what is our data wicket. So if you can visualize, a striker plays the ball into the covers and then sets off immediately as the striker sets off. The back foot slips. Let's say he's got no spikes uh, uh, um, on his uh, um, shoe, and the back foot slips, and it goes against the wicket. The bells gets the slot, so wicket is down. In that case, the striker should be given out hit wicket, because after playing at the ball, he set off immediately. When I speak about a delay or a pause, if you can visualize this, the striker playing the ball in the uh, into the covers. But then the, uh, the striker sees the ball goes towards, let's say, the cover fielder. The striker then says to his to the non-striker, wait, wait. So he first uh, wait. So there's a pause and he's waiting to see whether the ball is um, going past the fielder or if, or, or if the fielder is misfielding the ball because of that delay and that pause. And then if the striker let's set off and foot slips and puts the wicket down. In this case, it will be not out. And the reason for that is because the law is clear, that setting off for that first run should be immediate. If it's immediate um, and the striker puts the wicket down or this foot, uh, out hit the wicket. If it's not immediate, if there's a pause or a delay, and then the striker sets off and put the wicket down with his foot, um, the striker should be given uh, not out. Strikers also out hit wicket if the striker lawfully makes a second or further stroke to guard his or her wicket. It's an um, example of this, the striker plays forward. Um, the ball then has a little bit of spin and suddenly starts spinning towards uh, the, 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 um, the wicket. The striker then sees the ball spinning towards the wicket, um, hits the ball away to guard um, his, his or her wicket. And in hitting the ball, guarding his or her wicket, and the striker then puts the wicket down with his or her bat, the striker shall be given out hit wicket. So now we've covered how the striker can, uh, can be given out hit wicket. So we've covered the, the two conditions that needs to be um, um, that needs to be um, in play, and we've covered how the, um, and things the striker can do to be given out hit wicket. Remember earlier I spoke about the condition that one of the conditions that, that needs to be in place is that if the uh, the, stri the bowler's back foot needs to land or the bowler needs to be in his or her delivery stride and only after the bowler's in his or her delivery stride, then only the striker can be uh, given out hit wicket. So what happens if the wicket is put down before the bowler enters his, his or her delivery stride? The law is clear here. If it happens before the bowler enters the delivery stride, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. So just an example of this, the, uh, the bowler on top of his, of his or her run up takes about two or three uh, steps and the striker, uh, his trigger movement um, is very early and with the trigger movement, the striker then um, knocks off one of uh, the bells, but this is only after the bowler took about took one or two steps, and this is before the bowler entered the delivery stride. In this case, before because the wicket was put down before the bowler entered the delivery stride, this will be uh, the either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So there are times where the striker will be not out yet wicket. Let's see what are those instances. The striker shall be not out yet wicket if the striker puts the wicket down and the striker has completed any action in receiving the delivery. So what bullet point number one is trying to, to tell us is 
that once the striker has completed any action, or another way of putting this, once the striker has completed the shot, once the shot is done, and he's complete, once the shot is done, and the striker then puts the wicket down, the striker should not be given out his wicket. So the important thing to take away from bullet point number one is the striker shall be not out hit wicket if the striker puts the wicket down after the striker has completed any action in facing the delivery if the striker has completed uh, his or her shot once the shot is done and then the striker puts down the um, the wicket the striker shall be not out hit wicket. So that's the important thing. Shot is done, then the wicket is put down, not out. You can only put down the, you can only be out hit wicket, or the striker can only be out hit wicket if, uh, if it uh, happens while the striker is preparing to receive the delivery, uh, while the striker is in the uh, playing the shot, while uh, while while the striker, if you can if you can uh, visualize this, um, the uh, the striker plays a cut shot, and while playing the cut shot, the striker puts the uh, clips off a bell. So that was while playing the shot. So if if it's, if you if the striker puts the wicket down while playing the shot, uh, you should be given out eight wicket. If he's, the striker has completed the shot and then puts the wicket down, should be not out hit wicket. Also, the striker shall be not out hit wicket if the striker uh, puts down the wicket while uh, while running. But this is not referring to, as I said in the previous slide, um, that uh, when the striker immediately set off uh, for the first run. In that case, the striker shall be given out hit wicket. In in um, the striker shall be not out hit wicket if the striker puts down the wicket any other time. An example of this is, let's say the striker. Um, if you can just visualize this, the striker uh, plays the ball into the covers. Uh, the batter set off. They run a single. They then turn for the 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 second as um, They've turned for the second, and the ball then gets returned by the cover fielder towards towards the the wicket keeper. The striker then sees uh, this is going to be tight. Um, he feels that he needs to dive to make his ground. The striker then dives towards the wicket. Remember, this is now on the second run, and the ball gets returned to the wicket keeper. The striker dives to make his ground. As the striker is diving towards the wicket. And he's sliding. The striker gets uh, goes over the popping crease, and after get over the popping crease, and, um, the, the striker's bat clips the stumps and takes the bales off. Uh, in back in my playing days, before I did my first uh, um, um, course in umpiring, um, and uh, when I played, we had, at times had player umpires. Um, many a bat batter was given out hit wicket in this scenario. I've even been given out hit wicket uh, on my fourth run, diving, um, sliding to make my ground. My bat um, clipped the stumps, bells was off. I was given out hit wicket. Fielders didn't know the law. They just saw bat going against the wicket. According to them, that's hit wicket. I was given out. I didn't even argue. I, I, at the time, I thought it was out. As only once I did my my uh, first um, course in umpiring did I realize there was quite a few times that I was uh, incorrectly given out uh, in this fashion, and so were many other other batters. So if it happens, if the striker puts the wicket down while running, uh, the second run, third run, fourth run, and he clips and he builds, gets uh, wicket is down, it will be not out hit wicket. The striker shall also be not out hit wicket if the striker tried to avoid being run out or the striker uh, tried to avoid being stumped. 
any of these two circumstances, not out, hit, wicket. Also, striker will be not out, hit, wicket. If the striker tries to avoid a throw at any time. So throw comes in from the boundary, the striker uh, sees the ball coming uh, towards his or her head, try to give um, you know, a way of the ball, trams on, on, the, on the stumps, putting the wicket down, strikers are not be given out hit wicket. The strikers are also not be given out hit wicket. If even after the bowler has entered his or her delivery stride, the striker then uh, in his trigger move, movement back and across, trams on his thumbs, but the wicket is down, but the bowler did, uh, did not release the ball. Because the bowler did not release the ball, the striker shall be not out, hit wicket. The bowler needs to release the ball. If he didn't, not out, hit wicket. And lastly, if it's a no ball and the striker puts his wicket down, whether, he, whether it's with his bat or person, the striker shall not be given out it wicket. Uh, Tom, I've covered my two laws for the evening. I'm now passing the ball over to you. Thank you, Abdullah, and good evening to all the candidates. I'm going to take you through three laws this evening. Let us start with another contentious mode of dismissal, obstructing the field. And we've got a nice video to watch to take us through the law. Obstructing the field. A batsman is out obstructing the field if he or she willfully attempts to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action. Like this, for example. Thank you, Tommy. In particular, it is considered to be obstruction if, while the ball is in play and after the striker has played the ball, Either batsman willfully strikes the ball with a hand not holding the bat or any other part of his or her person or with the bat. The exception to this is when the batsman is attempting to defend his or her wicket. The batsman may do this with the bat or any part of his or her person except with the hand not holding the bat. If the batsman uses such a hand, he or she will be out obstructing the field. The handled the ball law no longer exists, with such incidents now covered by obstructing the field instead. The obstruction has to be willful. Accidental obstruction or obstruction caused by trying to avoid injury does not count, and the decision on that is down to the umpire. It's worth noting that if a catch is obstructed, it is the striker who is out, even if it was the non-striker who caused the obstruction. Mind you, it's not always an easy decision. Here, the batsman deliberately crosses out of the legal running area in order to attempt to obstruct a throw. There is no other reason why the batsman should be running across the pitch. What looked an accident was, in fact, an illegal incident. To avoid any possible confusion, read Law 37 in black and white in the blue book. Obst are there any runs scored if a striker is out mm, obstructing the field? The non-striker can also be out obstructing the field. Let's see what the law says in terms of runs scored when a batter is out obstructing the field. When either batter is dismissed obstructing the field, unless the obstruction prevents a catch from being made, Runs completed by the batters before the offence shall be scored, together with any runs awarded for penalties to either side. 
If the obstruction prevents a catch from being made, runs completed by the batters shall not be scored, but any penalties awarded to either side shall stand. So similarly, as to when a batter is out court, there are no runs awarded to the batting side, except for any penalties awarded. There will be no runs awarded to the batting side if a striker is out obstructing the field because of a prevention of a catch. Uh, very important. I think it came up as a question in level two. The bowler does not get credit for the mode of dismissal obstructing the field. Law 38 is run out. When is a batter out run out? The law says that either batter is out run out if at any time while the ball is in play, he or she is out of his or her ground and his or her wicket is fairly put down by the action of a fielder, including contact with a helmet worn by a fielder or a wicket keeper. So this law came in in 2017, where if the ball hits the helmet worn by a fielder or a wicket keeper, it does not become dead and it constitutes as being part of that fielder's person. So a wicket keeper can stump a striker using only the grill of the helmet um, or any other part of his person, of course, if the ball doesn't lodge comfortably in the gloves. Uh, sometimes the ball does ricochet off the body onto the stumps. So the helmet being worn, which is the important part, either by a wicket keeper or by a short leg fielder, uh, can assist in a catch, a stumping or a run out. Even though no ball has been called and whether or not a run is being attempted, okay, if the batter is out of his or her ground, and the wicket is fairly put down, then the batter shall be given out, run out. There are a few exceptions, which we shall go through on the next slide. So when is the batter not out, run out? A batter is not out, run out, if he or she has been within his or her ground and has subsequently left his or her ground to avoid injury, when the wicket is put down. If the ball has not subsequently touched a fielder after the bowler has entered the delivery stride before the wicket is put down, the batter will not be out run out. Uh, a common one here is if the bowler bowls a legal delivery and the striker plays a straight drive straight down the pitch and the ball goes past the bowler. The bowler attempts to field it but does not get any touch on the ball and the ball goes straight into the non-striker's stumps. The bails fall off with the non-striker outside of his or her ground because they were backing up. The law tells us here that because there was no intervention from any fielder after the ball has come into play, the non-striker will not be out run out. If you recall on television, whenever there is a run out, they usually put on the scorecard the fielder that was involved in the run out. And because no fielder is involved in this particular incident I've just described, there shall not be a run out, even though the non-striker was out of his or her ground backing up. OK, so a fielder needs to touch the ball 
before the wicket is put down for the non-striker or even the striker to be out run out. When else is a batter not out run out? If he or she is stumped, then they will be not out run out, but rather out stumped. Now, if a no ball has been caught and the batter is out of his or her ground, not attempting a run, and the wicket is fairly put down by the wicket keeper without the intervention of another fielder. So that in essence is a stumping, and we all know that a batter cannot be outstumped of a no ball. So what the law is doing here is protecting the batter from being out run out of a no ball if the batter was not attempting a run and the wicket was put down by the wicket keeper. Quite importantly, and it will come up in our revision question, if there was intervention from another fielder other than the wicket keeper, then the striker would be out run out. Even if not attempting a run, as long as there's intervention from another fielder, then because the striker is outside of his crease, then they will be out run out of a no ball. Moving on to law 39, the last law for this evening before we get into our revision questions. Just a reminder that we are not going through every single law in the law book. We are going through the laws that are examined in the level three exam and also only the portions of the specific laws that are examined in the level three exam. So law 39 is stumped and we're only going to go through the video. So you know that you need to know the contents of this video to help you prepare for your exam. Stumped. All batsmen fear being stumped and all wicket keepers dream of stumping batsmen. So let's be clear about the law. The only player who can stump a batsman is this fellow, the wicketkeeper. A stumping can take place provided that the ball is not a no ball. You can be stumped off a wide, however. Here, for example, the batsman has moved out of his or her ground to play the ball, but has missed it and has not attempted a run. The wicket is fairly put down by the wicketkeeper without the intervention of another fielder. When all these conditions are met, the batsman will find that he or she has indeed been stumped. It's also okay for the ball to rebound onto the stumps off any part of the wicketkeeper, including his or her protective equipment or helmet. If it is a no ball, the batsman will not be outstumped and is also protected from being run out as long as he or she is not attempting a run. Don't be stumped about stumping. Get a copy of the Blue Book and study Law 39. Hello, good evening, everyone. I, I think I think we've lost Tom. Um, uh, Abdullah, sorry, Tom. Um, I I went on mute uh, for some reason. 
Um, oh, okay. So, <laughs> We've got you back. Okay. Apologies for that. Thanks, Tom. So I was just saying that uh, that is the end of the material that we are covering this evening for uh, the five laws. Now we're going to the revision questions that relate to these five laws. And at the end of the revision questions, we've got a nice video for you guys to watch and adjudicate a hit wicket appeal. So once again, uh, please join us in the interaction and we shall all learn together. First revision question for this evening. Uh, at 1315, the left arm spinner bowls a full length delivery towards the striker. The striker hits the ball against the helmet worn by the silly point fielder. The ball ricochets in the air towards the cover fielder who catches the ball. The fielder, seeing that the inform batter at the non-striker's end is short of his or her ground, throws down the wicket at the bowler's end with the non-striker short of his or her ground. There is an appeal. What is your decision? Out or not out? And if out, which mode of dismissal is out? And is the non-striker out or is the striker out? Uh, Abdullah, this is a fairly straightforward one, I should think. We will give it to the first hand up, please. First hand up, um, Tom, was Arun. Arun, if you can unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Yeah. If we see the order of priority, the first one goes to bold and then to the catch. Since the catch is already taken, here the uh, helmet is not on the field. It is on the uh, head of the uh, fielder. So the catch is already taken. So that the striker is out and any action thereafter to get the other batter run out is not valid. That's correct, Arun. Well done. Let's look at the memorandum answer. Pretty similar to what you've given us. Remember what we say is you need to uh, give us the relevant law first and then apply it to the scenario which is exactly what Arun did. So the relevant law is says that the striker is out caught if the ball delivered by the bowler not being a no ball touches his or her bat without previously being in contact with any fielder and is subsequently held by a fielder as a fair catch before it touches the ground. If the striker is not out bowled, then he or she is out caught even though a decision against either better for another method of dismissal would be justified. In this scenario, the striker is out caught as the ball can strike the fielder's helmet and still be caught. Upon the catch being taken, the ball immediately becomes dead and the run out of the non-striker will be ignored. OK, so just a very formal way of saying what Arun have said. Um, if it was for three marks, Arun, I would have given you all of those three marks. So well done. Next question. At 1758, the final ball of the 104th over of the day, the batter gets an inside edge to the ball. The ball ricochets from the wicketkeeper's glove onto the helmet's visor before bouncing back onto the wickets with the striker short of his ground. There is an appeal. Discuss in full and explain the procedure to follow. Um, I just need to add that close of play in this particular three day match is at 1800. OK, so that is a playing condition that uh, would be in the exam in the earlier in the question or maybe at the top of the page and there are a few questions related to that match. Um, so on this particular screenshot, there isn't that playing condition, but it will be given to you in the exam. So 1800 is the scheduled close of play at 1758. The final ball of the 104th over of the day, the batter gets an inside edge to the ball. The ball ricochets from the wicketkeeper's glove onto his helmet before bouncing onto the wickets with the striker short of his ground. 
there is an appeal. So the first thing that we need to determine, and I'm going to ask the first hand to give us this answer, Abdullah, is, is the striker out or not out? And what mode of dismissal is in play? Uh, Tom, first hand was Jitindra. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, so in this case, the wicket keepers, uh, the ball first comes to the wicket keeper's glove and on the way it goes to his own helmet, what he's wearing, I mean visor, and then bounce back onto the wicket with the striker shot off his ground. So this is, uh, it's, it's not a, a no ball, it's a fair delivery. So nowhere it's mentioned it's a no ball. So he can be stumped out, point number one. Point number two, uh, the striker is not attempting a run. So it, this also is not given in the question that is attempting a run. So he can be run out. Two valid points uh, I'm seeing here that he can be stumped out. So, and he was out of the ground and the ball hits the wicket. So he is out stumped out. So the question asked was, how, is he out? Yes, he's out. How, what is the mode of the distribution? He's out stumped. Yeah, this, that's my answer. Perfect, Jitendra. That's the first two marks. Uh, well answered for this particular example. Uh, now, Abdullah, uh, we have a wicket falling within two minutes of the close of play. Uh, what happens next? Also, considering that the um, overs for the day that should be bold, and this is again in the playing conditions, are 120. But uh, as we see here, we're only on uh, over number 104. Um, or it could be that this is a four-day match and it is only 104 overs to be bold. Um, so, Abdullah, can the next hand up please tell us what happens next? Uh, Varun, can you, can you please tell us what happens next? Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, if sir, um, sir, can you repeat, sir, what what's the minimum over of for the day? Uh, Varun, the minimum overs for the day is one hundred and four. So it is actually the last over of the day. Then, uh, as it is the last over of the day and is the final ball, as well as less than two minutes remain uh, for the uh, less than three minutes remain for the close of play. So, in a, so we will call play, and uh, it would be the close of play. And next day we will start on time. There won't uh, be any adjustment in the time. Uh, perfect. Varun, let's have a look at the um, answer, which I don't think is in full here. It only gives us the um, mode of dismissal and whether the striker is out or not out. So it says, if the wicket is put down by the ball, it sh shall be regarded as having been put down by the wicket keeper if the ball rebounds onto the stumps from any part of the wicket keeper's person or equipment or has been kicked or thrown onto the stumps by the wicket keeper. The umpire should give the batter out stumped. And for uh, more marks, um, you spot on Varun, uh, the, because the wicket falls within uh, three minutes of the scheduled close of play, it's actually within two minutes, uh, but the law says within three minutes, then stumps shall be called. And because we have bowled the required number of overs in the day, uh, then there will be no adjustment to the overs required to be bowled the next day, and the next day's play shall start on time. Okay, that is that question done. Next question, and here we've got some playing conditions again. In a three-day match, the scheduled close of play is at 1800. At 1752, Team Blue are 318 for nine after 115.2 overs of the allotted 120 overs in the day's play when the striker who is batting outside of his ground to the spinner edges the ball and is caught by the first slip fielder 
off the wicket keeper's grill. The umpire calls no ball for a foot fault. The wicket keeper, seeing the striker who is not attempting a run, is still out of his ground, breaks the wicket after receiving the ball back from the first slip. There is an appeal from the fielders, so we need to know is the batter out or not out, and which mode of dismissal is he or she out or not out. Uh, so I'm going to repeat it again, and like we've mentioned in previous lectures, you need to break down the question into small pieces, not to confuse yourself. So read the careful, read the question carefully, and incident by incident, you need to decide which mode of dismissal is in play and whether the striker is out or not out. So when the striker who is batting outside his ground to the spinner edges the ball and is caught by the first slip fielder of the wicket keeper's grill. So we need to decide is the ball still alive if it comes off the wicket keeper's grill. Uh, then we have the issue of a no ball that complicates things a little bit. And then we have the wicket keeper seeing that the striker is outside of his ground, breaks the wicket. The striker, though, is not attempting a run. And the interesting part here is that the wicket keeper has received the ball from first slip. So a lot to consider. And also after the dismissal, if the batter is out, uh, what happens next? First thing I want to know, Abdullah, is the batsman out or not out? And what is the mode of dismissal in play, please? Uh, Tom, we have six hands, but I'm going to give um, those an opportunity that didn't answer yet this evening. So, uh, so Bavin, if you can unmute yourself and give us um, the first answer, out or not out? Uh, on my decision, the batsman is out. Uh, it is a uh, run out. Excellent, Bavin. Uh, can you explain to us, um, even though the batter is not attempting a run, why is he out, run out of a noble? Uh, according to me, when the ball was delivered, he attempted the shot and it hit the uh, uh, wicket keeper's grill and went to as a catch. But due to the no ball, the catch was not counted. But he was out of his ground and the fielder immediately throws back the ball to the wicket keeper to break the wicket. So it is called a run out. Uh, quite correct. The important part here is that there was an intervention of a fielder. If it was only the wicket keeper who broke the stumps without having got the ball from the wicket keeper, sorry, from the first slip, if only the wicket keeper was involved, then the batter would be not out stumped because it's a no ball and would also be not out run out because he was not attempting a run. Uh, but, um, yeah. but but because there was the intervention of the first slip fielder, then the batter can be out run out, even though he was not attempting a run. Okay. Yes, Perfect. Thanks for that. Now we're going to ask the next hand, Abdullah, what happens next? Because it is 17.52 when the wicket falls and schedule close of play is at 1800. And of course, this is now the 10th wicket that has fallen. Uh, next hand, Tom, is uh, Bavis. Yeah, hi Abdullah, hi Tom. Hello Bavis. 
Yeah, so this is the 10th wicket. Since there are less than 10 minutes remaining to the end of the day, we will call stumps. And uh, I don't know about the time adjustment, but I can see there are one, one, uh, 116 overs bold. And we consider three overs for the inning change and interval. So that counts to 119 overs already completed. So I don't know whether the time adjustment would be made on next day or not. Thanks, Bhavesh. Um, pretty good answer. Let's see what the memorandum says about uh, the next day's play. Uh, we'll start off with the decision and remember what we've said is you need to write down the laws that are relevant to the scenario before applying the law to the scenario so the law says that either batter is out run out if at any time while the ball is in play he or she is out of his or her ground and his or her wicket is fairly put down by the action of a fielder even though a no ball has been called and whether or not a run is being attempted. So that is a run out definition without a no ball. Then we go to the no ball scenario. The striker is not out run out if a no ball has been called and he or she is out of his or her ground, not attempting a run, and the wicket is fairly put down by the wicket keeper without the intervention of another fielder. So we've stated to the two laws in play and now we're going to apply that law into the scenario in the scenario there is an intervention from the first slip fielder before the wicket keeper breaks the wicket with the striker out of his ground therefore the striker will be out run out at 1752 team blue is now all out then we apply the intervals law if an innings ends when 10 minutes or less remain before the time agreed for close of play on any day, there shall be no further play on that day. No change shall be made to the start for, apologies, no change shall be made to the time for the start of play on the following day on the count of the 10 minute interval between innings. In this scenario, time will be called at 17.55, the overs lost in the day will not be made up and play will start at the original start time the following day. So when you have not reached the overs, minimum overs for the day, uh, by the time that stumps is called, you do not uh, play on unless you have in your playing conditions the extra 30 minutes to complete the overs. Here there is not that playing condition in the question. Um, you only adjust your start time for the next day or add overs to a middle session, again depending on the playing conditions. If you have lost time on previous days, and in this question, there was nothing about time being lost. The overs were obviously just bowled slowly by the fielding side or sides on that particular day. OK. Quite a bit to put down on paper for your six marks, but just remember to give your interpretation of the law and then apply it to the scenario that is being asked and you do not have to write out as much as is written here but if you've got all of those points in some form or other in your answer then you will get the six marks right now we move on to a hit wicket incident and I'm going to uh, play up until when the TV umpire is asked to make a decision. And I'm going to ask all of you to type in your decision in the chat box. 
as to out or not out. And then I will ask Abdullah to choose one of the out uh, umpires to give a reason why they're giving Brendan Taylor out hit wicket. And then I'm going to ask Abdullah to ask one of the not out umpires to give a reason for why they are not giving Brendan Taylor out hit wicket. So let's watch the clip up until the decision is about to be made by the TV umpire. Yeah, that's what can happen when you're set and you think the pitch is behaving very nicely. End of the over. Now, what has happened here? Well, has he, uh, has he uh, somehow touched the stumps? Uh, what's, what's going on here? One yeah, of the Brendan bales... Taylor, I think, after he's played the shot, has knocked the bales off with his bat. Now, I didn't see what was happening. I just heard it in my ear. And uh, Shaki Balasan has gone and uh, appealed to Maria Erasmus. So, discussion going on between those two men. Interesting to see what happened here, actually. Well, he's just uh, checking with the uh, fielders. And we're not too sure, but the bales were off. One of the bales. Let's see what has happened. It's fine. It's a legal delivery. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor de departs in that fashion. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What does he do? Oops, that's gone. That's gone. He cannot believe his luck. I thought it's going to be his lucky day today. Unlucky second time around. Okay, we're just going to have a look at it again. And please, guys, don't let the commentator uh, decide for you what the decision is. We all know that commentators don't know their laws. Uh, so make your decision based on your knowledge of the hit wicket law and what Abdullah has described to us this evening. So let's uh, watch it again from the point where the bowler off. Balls. One of the bail. Let's see what has happened. It's fine. It's a legal delivery. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor de departs in that fashion. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What does he do? Oops, that's gone. That's gone. He cannot believe his luck. I thought it's going to be his lucky day today. So, Abdullah, over to you, and you can uh, read out how many outs have we got, how many not outs have we got, and then you can choose one from each camp to tell us why they've made the decision that they have made. Tom, we have 12 decisions in, or 13 now, um, in the chat box. And we have 13 not out decisions, Tom. 14 not outs now. 15 oh, wow. and counting. Okay. Brilliant. So I'm yeah. going to, um, there's another one, 16, 17. They're coming in thick and fast, Tom. <laughs> I'm going to just, um, Tom, randomly, seeing that there's about 18 to 20 not outs now. So um, I'm now going to, to just randomly um, uh, choose a, a name and I'm going to go to the names that I haven't answered yet this, this evening. Okay, great. Um, and let me, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm just thinking of, of, of um, my method of choosing. Let, let's go, um, I'm going to go, first criteria is who I haven't answered yet and second criteria is um, the picking order, how the answers came in. Perfect. So, yeah, so let me see who's number one. Um, Jitendra was number one. Um, did it, I'm sure Jitendra gave an answer this evening, did he, Tom? 
I'm not sure, Dilla. <laughs> I think he did. Um, so um, Aaron also did. Aaron was number two. Yeah. Olamidi is number three. So that, in the picking see. order, Omeli gave a nod out. So uh, Olamidi, can you unmute yourself and explain to us why you gave this decision as nod out? Good evening. Uh, well, from what the law says, the law says that the the action of breaking the wicket should be immediately after the bowler has entered his delivery straight and while the batter is preparing to receive the delivery or while receiving the de delivery he puts down his wickets by his pressing his item of clothing or his equipment or with his bat. Now in this scenario, uh, Taylor has had the opportunity to receive the delivery. The ball had gone past him. He had he had um, completed his action in receiving the delivery and everything that comes afterwards, in my opinion, is not immediately after he has received the delivery. Uh, some time had passed. So for me, it's not out. Perfect, Olumide. That is a textbook answer. You have gone and you have quoted the law or given your understanding of the law. Um, like I said before on numerous occasions, you do not have to uh, quote the law verbatim. We don't expect you to memorize the law book and we don't expect you to memorize what law number is relevant to the question as long as you know which law is relevant to the question and you are able to put down your understanding of that law correctly as Olumide just has. And once you've put down your understanding of the relevant law, then you apply it to the scenario which Olumide did perfectly. Um, here we see that the shot is completed and only after the shot is completed does Brendan Taylor put down his wicket with his bat. So the correct decision there is not out. Incidentally, and I didn't play further than the TV umpire's decision, the TV umpire gave that decision out and again the hit wicket uh, law is a uh, opinion law. So in that TV umpire's opinion, uh, the hitting or the breaking of the stumps by Brendan Taylor was still in the process of receiving the delivery, uh, which I and most umpires who have seen this incident disagree with and I also would have given that uh, not out. Uh, Abdullah, you want to give us your version of that scenario as well, please? Uh, not out for me as well, Tom, and Ulamidi has explained it brilliantly. Um, he, um, he put it in his own words, but he said exactly what the law um, tells us, uh, that he's completed um, his action after receiving the delivery and once you've completed the the shot and you then put your wicket down uh, you cannot be out it wicket thanks tom thanks Dula. uh just to finish off on on that particular incident uh, you will have seen that Mireille rasmus was quite animated in explaining to the bangladeshi players what he had seen and he, I've spoken to him about this incident. He was quite convinced that the TV umpire would give the decision not out. And the reason he went to speak to the Bangladeshi players was to explain the law, just as Olumide has explained it, that in his opinion, uh, or, or at least uh, the TV umpire needs to decide whether or not Brendan Taylor had completed playing the shot uh, or, or completed receiving the delivery because he actually didn't play a shot um, before he broke the stumps. So obviously there would have been remonstrations 
and a big hoo-ha from the Bangladeshi players if the batter was given not out and uh, Murray Rasmus was actually trying to prepare them for that eventuality. Uh, but the TV umpire surprised everyone and um, Brendan Taylor's reaction as well when he was given out uh, was not a pleased reaction. Um, so guys, very important. We don't have at club cricket level the luxury of a TV umpire and replays. So you would get together with your partner. Remember that appeal is directed at the strikers and umpire. It is under the strikers and jurisdiction to decide on hit wicket decisions. So buy yourself some time, come together, ask your partner what he saw or she saw and talk through the law before you give a hit wicket decision out or not out so that you are able to explain it to either the batter if you give the batter out or the fielding captain if you give the batter not out because there will be questions raised. It is usually a contentious decision to give out or not out. Great, thanks very much for the interaction on that from all of you and well done for all giving not out. Some of you are a bit slow to give your not out um, but I'm sure you'll improve on on that as you gain more experience. Right, so moving on to questions in the chat box. Uh, Crystal Prinsloo asks, when we write our exam, do we need to, in answering a question, first state what the law says about the scenario and then give the answer to the question? Christo, that is what I've repeated all evening and you will see in the memorandum answers that that is exactly what they do. You get marks for putting down the law and then you get marks for interpreting the law to the scenario. Okay. Mervyn, all our recordings are put on YouTube, so you don't need to ask. You will always get the link two hours after the end of the lecture. Uh, Umesh asks, can a wicketkeeper run out a striker or batter when he fields the ball without his gloves and breaks the wicket without his glove on without an intervention of any fielder? If it's a no ball, that's question number one. And question number two, if it is a legal delivery. Abdullah, I'm going to hand that one over to you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, th thank you, uh, Umesh. The wicketkeeper is the only fielder that's allowed um, to wear gloves. He can opt not to wear them. The law allows him to wear uh, a pair of gloves and for good reason. Uh, just imagine doesn't uh, didn't wear gloves and he had to uh, catch uh, um, three, four hundred balls uh, every day. I don't think his hands will last, but the law allows the keeper to wear a pair of gloves. He doesn't have to wear the gloves. If the keeper opts not to wear them, that is his prerogative, but the law allows the keeper to wear the gloves. If the keeper then decides to remove the gloves. So, so um, the law allows the keeper to wear the gloves and the gloves needs to be on the keeper's um, hands at all times. If the, if the keeper removes the gloves for whatever reason, and we've seen on TV, sometimes the, the ball goes to short fine leg or short third man and the keeper uh, runs towards it, uh, 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 throws his uh, uh, glove down, pick up the ball and size towards uh, the stumps. This is a, a reason sometimes when the keeper remove uh, the gloves. There are no issue. The keeper can uh, remove the glove at any time, but what the keeper needs to uh, realize is because the glove is now not on his or her um, hand, if the ball should make contact with that glove at any time while the ball is still in play, 
five penalty runs will be awarded to the batting side. That will be seen as illegal fielding. We covered the illegal fielding in the previous lecture. There's a fairly harsh penalty when it comes to uh, illegal fielding. So that would be an example of if uh, the uh, keeper discarded this glove for whatever reason, and the ball makes contact, so the keeper can discard the glove. The keeper, even if the keeper put the glove, I've seen keepers put it um, in their pants behind their back or in front of uh, their back. Yeah, if the keeper wants to do it, by all means, no problem. But I, if I see that, I will whisper in that keeper's ear, that glove's supposed to be um, worn. And because you're putting it in your trouser, if the ball should make contact with the glove, it will be deemed illegal fielding um, and uh, five penalty runs plus the other uh, punishment shall be uh, um, given. So now to answer your question, uh, Umis, so can the wicketkeeper run up the striker when there's no glove on the hand? Yes, absolutely no problem. The keeper, the keeper can do it. Uh, but the keeper must just realize, so once he's removed the glove and let's say it's on the floor and while that ball is in play, it, if it should strike that uh, the glove, it shall be uh, deemed illegal fielding. So, Tom, did I answer the question? 100% Tula. And um, it doesn't matter whether it's a no ball or a legal delivery because um, this is a run out. And um, in fact, hang on, if, 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 if it is a no ball and there hasn't been a run attempted, then the striker will be protected from being uh, out run out. Are you happy with that, Abdullah? Uh, yes, Tom. Thank you. Uh, next question. I'm just scrolling through all the not outs. And it looks like there are no further questions. Uh, we do have uh, hands up. Uh, Mervyn, your hand was up first. Please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. If you are still with us, Mervyn, I know you're at work. Doesn't look like Mervyn is still with us, so I'm going to lower his hand. The next hand up is Jitendra. Uh, Jitendra, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Uh, actually, I don't have any doubts or queries here. I, uh, from the heart, I wanted to thank you both uh, that you both uh, taught us this particular law in such a fantastic fashion that uh, all of us, most of us, I mean, 20, 25 of us uh, replied not out. In spite of the competitive training that it was out, it was confusing, <laughs> but still we all 20, 25 of us were, uh, were clear about what you guys, you both taught us. And uh, that really uh, touched my heart. I was confident on myself that the answer is not out. But when I saw everybody answering the same, in spite of the commentator telling that, I really felt so great of you both. I, uh, it's just a token of appreciation for you both, sir. Thank you. Jitendra, uh, I was uh, probably the happiest person in the world when Abdullah told me that uh, everybody was answering not out uh, because I was displaying the video. I couldn't see the chat box at the time. Um, so yes, thank you um, for your kind words. Uh, we do try and be as... Um, we try and simplify the laws because we know that the laws can be complicated, especially in the Queen's English that they're written in in the law book. And we try and give examples for you guys to better understand uh, what we are trying to teach. So I'm glad that uh, we are getting through to you and very happy that everybody got this particular scenario correct. Uh, next hand up is a name I've never seen before. Uh, Kutub, uh, welcome. Please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, gentlemen, and thank you very much for welcoming me. I've been following this course very much. Um, my question, I'll take you back. Uh, yesterday's uh, 
uh, seminar, I just uh, tried and figured out uh, regarding interruptions and uh, scheduled breaks. Now, this is uh, a, a bit tricky. If there is an interruption of rain, and then board captains and empires decide that we would like to have an early lunch. So now lunch becomes a scheduled break. So if the field is out for 20 minutes, it starts raining. And then he informs you, or he does not inform you that he'll be back, but you are having lunch, which is a scheduled break. How will you count out the penalty time for the fielder? Abdullah, you are our penalty time specialist. Do you want to take that one for us, please? Uh, yes, Tom, thanks. Kutub, thank you so much uh, for your question. So, Kutub, when it comes to calculating uh, penalty time, a uh, fielder will only get penalty time against his name if he's not on the field for uh, for playing time. So when it comes to uh, the a lunch interval, so let's say the at 11.30, the uh, player went off the field, it started raining at 11.50. That's correct. 11 yeah, 11.50, um, the both umpires and captains and as per law 11.4, it allows them if uh, uh, all four agrees, lunch can be taken early. So because lunch is a scheduled interval, the the um, and, and lunch is usually 40 minutes. So lunch will be from 11.50 until 12.30. So the injured fielder was only off the field for 20 minutes from 11.30 till 12.50. So at the start of lunchtime, his penalty time will be 20 minutes. If um, conditions allow play to start at 12.30, because lunch is a scheduled interval, you cannot count, uh, that interval will not count for the fielder, nor again, so you cannot uh, uh, add it to his penalty time, nor can you subtract it. So at the end of lunch at 12.30, if player restarts and that injured player walks onto the field with the fielding uh, side, you need to inform the, the fielder that he owes 20 minutes of penalty time and he should, uh, you inform this uh, captain as as well. So that that is when there's a scheduled interval. So you will not add the the, the time to the penalty time that he owes. He, so in this scenario, and if player restarts at 12.30 and he's on the field, you, you will only owe us 20 minutes of, of penalty time. So he can bowl again at 12.50. Kutub, did I answer your question? Yeah, you answered my question, but uh, let's say if play stops at 11.50 for rain interruption yeah. and the play and then lunch is taken at about 12.15 because we agree that uh, let's have early lunch and lunch is taken at, at 12.15. Now between 11.50 and 12.15, the fielder is already out for 20 minutes does not inform the empire himself that he's ready for play. And after lunch, from 12.15, which is 40 minutes, which will go to up to uh, 12.55, what will happen? Will, uh, will the 15 minutes from, from 11.50 to 12.15, the time which is taken, which is... Uh, 25 minutes include with the 20 minutes that is 40 minutes so when he comes back after lunch he'll he'll have to stay on the field for 40 minutes um Kutub, can i i i lost you um, midway uh tom did did you understand what Kutub was asking yes if you can just uh, i lost i lost him halfway no problem um, yeah just so... yeah just give it to me again please 
So in this scenario, uh, the player goes off at 11.30. And 11.30 it, goes off, yeah. It starts raining at 11.50. Uh, but yeah, rain. lunch is not taken at 11.50. Lunch is only taken at 12.15. So there is 25 minutes of rain interruption before lunch is taken. Lunch is yeah. obviously 40 minutes. So they go back onto the field at 12.55. So Kutub is asking how much penalty time will need to be served uh, when the player comes back onto the field after lunch. Okay, uh, I'm now on, on the same page. So Kutub, when it comes to a player serving penalty time, he can only serve penalty time if he's not on the field of play while play was in progress. So only playing time that is not on the field of play uh, he needs to serve that as penalty time. So from 11.30 till 11.50, the player was not on the field of play. So the play was in progress for, 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 that, um, for that 20 minutes. It started raining at 11.50. So which means everyone left the field, no play was in progress. Lunch was only taken at, I think you said 12.15, uh, Tom. Correct. So that is, that is 25 minutes later. So there was no play. No one was on the field. So I just said that um, you can only add penalty time to a player's uh, account if that player was not on the field while play was in progress. So between 11.50 and 12.15, there was no play in progress. So you cannot add that 25 minutes to his penalty time because there was no play in progress. Um, it was raining. And then let's say they took lunch at 12.15. Um, and um, if weather conditions uh, allow it, the players come back at 12.55 and the injured player joins the team at 12.55, that player will only owe 20 minutes of penalty time. Uh, I, I, can, I can add something to, to this because there is a method why, um, that this player could have offset an unscheduled break against penalty time that he, the, that he owes. There was an unscheduled break from 11.50 to 12.15. So for that 25 minutes, there was an unscheduled uh, break. So once there's an unscheduled break, you need to ask yourself one or two questions. Was the fielder on the field of play when it started raining? Or was it off the field at, uh, when it started raining? So the answer to this question is he was off the field when it started raining. So for him to set the, uh, the unscheduled break off against penalty time that he owes, he had to personally inform the um, uh, either of the umpires while that unscheduled break was taking place, when he was fit again, then from that time he could have offset um, um, the unscheduled break against the penalty time that he owes. Uh, but again, just to answer your question, he only owes us 20 minutes. You cannot add that 25 minutes to penalty time that he owes because no play was in progress um, for while it was raining. Penalty time will only be added to his account if he's not on the field uh, when uh, when uh, everyone or while everyone's playing. Did I answer the question, Tom? I think you did. Uh, Kutub, you happy? Uh, Kutub, yeah, uh, did yeah. I answer it? Yeah, you, you answered me correctly, but they, uh, there's a catch there that if the batsman does not, I mean, if the fielder in person does not inform the umpire during the interruption. An interruption is that it is not a scheduled break. Interruption is not a scheduled break. If it would have been a scheduled break, then the time penalty would not have taken into account. But this is an interruption. Now, if it is an interruption, everybody goes out. That is correct. Now, if the fielder would have informed the umpire 
that I'm fit to play immediately at 11.50, then his time would have been deducted. The 20 minutes would have started from 11.50 deduction and it would have been reduced up to 12.15. I agree with you. I agree with you, Kutub. Yeah. If he yeah. personally informed the umpires that he was fit yeah. at 1150, um, his time will then immediately start reducing uh, from 1150 onwards. I agree with you, Kutub. So now, if he does not inform the umpire, that means the interruption time will not be added into his account? Uh, no, Kutub, it will not be added into his account uh, uh, the, because only playing time that the field is not on the field that gets added into uh, onto your account because no one was on the field during that rain interruption it does not get uh, get added to his account only playing time that is not on the field gets added to a injured player's uh, account Okay, so that means he has an advantage of reducing his penalty time if he would have informed the umpire immediately at interruption. Uh, correct. That is one of the methods how you can offset an unscheduled break against penalty time that uh, that you that the fielder owes, and 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 because he wasn't on the field um, at the start of the interruption, he had to personally inform the umpires when he was fit again, and if he had to do it at eleven fifty. Um, his penalty time would have started reducing uh, from that moment onwards. Thank you, sir. Did I answer your question? You're you happy, very Kutub? Very no, you, you're Thank welcome, you. Kutub. You're welcome. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Thanks, Kutub. Next hand up is Bavesh. Bavesh, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good evening, Tom. Good evening, Abdullah. I have a two question. Uh, First question is, uh, as we went through the slide about caught, uh, runs will not be scored if there is a caught, except penalty runs will still stand. Would you please take us to one scenario where the batsman is out with caught and the penalty runs awarded to the batting side? Abdullah, do you have a scenario in mind? I can't think of one offhand. Um, actually, I can. I if a, a fielder ran onto the pitch um, without probable cause, the ball wasn't going on the pitch, and the team has already had a warning for uh, fielders on the pitch uh, in the protected area, then uh, five penalty runs would be awarded to the batting side, but the catch would still be valid and the batter would be out. That's the only example I can think of, Abdullah. Can you think of any other? Uh, Tom, I got good disconnected. I only joined halfway. I actually didn't hear the question. Okay, no problem. Pavesh, are you happy with my example? Uh, yes, I'm happy. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Tom. Great. Uh, then we've got another Bavesh with uh, his hand up. Um, oh, I have a second question. All oh, right. Sorry. Carry on. <laughs> uh, no problem. Uh, thanks, Tom. Second question about the hit wicket. Uh, as we said that the court has a privilege against any other dismissal. Uh, of course, the bold is the first and second is the court. And then after other dismissal, how about hit wicket? And the same time there is a court also. What will be the final decision? It will be the court or the hit wicket. Uh, you already answered the question. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know the answer. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Out court, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Tommy, if I can just add something here. Yeah. yeah. So, so the uh, um, hit wicket is one of the the um, mode of dismissal that is um, unfolds under the strikers in umpire's jurisdiction. 
So strikers and umpire need to make the call when it comes to um, to uh, hit wicket. Uh, so let's uh, use an example where the the uh, the better pulls at the uh, pull um, uh, plays a pull shot. The ball then goes into the air, and while completing the pull shot, the batter then dislodges the bale, the bales. But so, and then, but the ball is still uh, in the air. So now, what's important here is the strikers and umpire. This needs to delay his or her decision and wait for the catch to be completed. Because while that ball is still in the air and the striker's in umpire makes a decision, the striker is in umpire lifts his or her finger to give the, the striker out his wicket. That decision of uh, or will then stand because the moment that umpire lifts, lifts uh, his or her finger, the ball will then immediately become dead and the striker will then be given out hit wicket. So you so if the ball gets hit in the air uh, and you strike us in and you see that, that the striker, let's say, hit his wicket or trams on his wicket, just delay your call, uh, let the fielder catch the ball. If um, And if the fielder catches the ball, fielders are, the striker's out caught. If you, the fielder drops it, um, you can give the striker out uh, eat wicket. Thank you very much, Abdullah. This is the answer which I was trying to understand because hit wicket incident happened first before the fielder take a catch. Uh, and, and, and being as a striker and uh, umpire responsibility of the hit wicket, uh, what you mentioned to delay your decision in order to conclude the final decision. Thank you. Uh, yes, so yeah. So the as soon if you lift your finger while that ball is still in the air, you, uh, the ball will then become dead because you made a batsman was now dismissed. You made a decision as strikers in empire, and the law guides us here. The moment a bat is dismissed, the ball automatically uh, becomes dead. So the moment strikers in lifts his or her finger, that ball then becomes dead, and then the heat wicket will then apply. Uh, thanks for your question. Good question, uh, Bavis. Uh, over to you, Tom. Bavis, Arya, thank you for clarifying, and Abdullah, thank you for adding to the answer. Uh, next, we've got Bavesh Panjwani with his hand up. Uh, your floor is yours. Please unmute your microphone. Bavesh Panjwani. Please unmute your microphone. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yeah, so my question is, what if the batsman deliberately puts the wicket down at the non-striker's uh, non -striker's end while running? Or if non-striker puts the wicket down at the striker's end just to make the run out difficult? Abdullah, you want to take that one? Yeah, so Tom, uh, the, uh, just to uh, confirm that I get, uh, they understand the question. So um, is Bavis saying while the bat is running, the oh, yeah. non the non striker deliberately, with it kick, kicking down or 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 pulling pulling out uh, the stumps, uh, pulling out the stumps um, in the running to make it difficult for the fielding side to put the wicker down. Yes, in some is way that, while yeah, is, using it, bat or. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, is my understanding of the question correct, Bavis? Yes. Okay, so uh, Bavis, very unsporting man uh, like conduct of the non uh, of one of the, the batters. We're going to have to apply uh, the law and let's say. Uh, it, kicks one of the stumps or it kicks the stumps down, we're going to have to then apply what the law say, how to break that wicket um, to affect a run out. 
So if let's say you just kicked it with one of the stumps um, out the ground and there's still two stumps um, uh, in there. So to break that wicket as per the law, you either need to, the, the fielders need to take the ball in the stumps and pull it out at the same time, um, needs to hit the stump with the ball in it out of the ground or needs to throw the ball uh, um, against the stumps and he needs to throw the stump out of the ground. So that is how to break a wicket uh, uh, if the if the wicket was put down while the ball was still in play. So we're gonna have to apply you're gonna have to apply the law in how to put that wicket down. Uh, secondly, we I will definitely uh, report the the batter. If I see that batter willfully putting that wicket down in order not to not to uh, to make it difficult for the fielding side to either run uh, um, him out or the or the or the other batter out, I will definitely put in a report because that is that is unsporting conduct. Tom, I'm not sure how you will handle it, but that's how I, I will handle it. Apply the law, how to put the wicket down, but definitely write in a, a report of the batter trying to willfully uh, uh, make it difficult for the fielding side to put the wicket down. Abdullah, I agree with you on both those points. Um, another point is the fielding side could well appeal for obstructing the field and I would definitely consider that if, for example, uh, there would have been a possibility of a run out. For example, if the ball was thrown in and the ball hit one of the two stumps still uh, in the pitched, but the ball didn't uh, put the wicket down with the bales off. So the three ways that you mentioned, uh, then the fielding side would have a very good case for obstructing the field. And so the batter would be putting himself or herself at risk for being given out obstructing the field. Pavesh, you happy with those answers? Yes. So I have some more questions. Uh, can I ask now or you will come back after? answering some of them. Uh, Bhavesh, let's uh, take one more from you and then we will move on to the other hands. And then if yeah. you have more questions, then we will get to you afterwards. OK, so my second question is, what is the fitness criteria for umpires in South Africa? Are there any or no? Uh, Bhavesh, uh, we next week, Thursday are going for our Cricket South Africa panel umpires preseason conference. And at every preseason conference, we have a medical checkup. And then we also have our fitness uh, test. Um, the fitness test involves uh, a 1.2 kilometer time trial and it involves uh, doing the plank for a as long as you can um, and then they also take our skin folds measurements now there is no particular uh, benchmark you set your own benchmark and throughout the season we will repeat those fitness uh, metrics and we need to show improvement or at least staying at the level that we were at pre-season uh, for us to be uh, judged as um, good enough to carry on. Um, obviously, if they see that our fitness has digressed through the season, uh, then there will be um, measurements put in place to improve our fitness, um, or we could risk our position on the panel for next season. Um, the fitness element is uh, one part of all of our KPIs, our key performance indices. And if we want to improve as umpires in terms of rankings in the list of panel umpires, then we need to improve our percentage 
out of 100, uh, which fitness I think is about 20%. So there's a lot of incentive for us to stay fit because we all know that the fitter you are physically, the better and longer you can concentrate for. And we definitely need to concentrate, especially late in the day's play when it's still hot and the game is coming to a tight conclusion. Uh, you as an umpire need to be at the top of your game, not tired, not waning in concentration. So fitness, a very big part of our duties. I hope that explains. Yeah, thank you for that. Great, we'll come back to you after the other hands. Uh, next hand up is Mervyn. Mervyn, please unmute your microphone if you are still with us. And the floor is yours. Good evening all, I'm still with you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. OK, Hi, yeah, guys. Uh, my, my question is uh, with regards to the hit wicket decision that was obviously given out. Uh, was there at any stage uh, consultation or or interaction with the two on-field umpires? That's my first question. Um, so you could see before the uh, on-field umpires went towards the Bangladeshi players that uh, Mireille Rasmus was gesturing and talking to the TV umpire. Because whenever you go up for any decision, it is good umpiring practice for you as the on-field umpire who's referring the decision to the TV umpire to give a brief description as to firstly what the appeal is for. Uh, in this case, it would have been hit wicket and any information that will help the TV umpire make a decision um, is also communicated. For hit wicket, there is no soft signal. Uh, we all know there's a soft signal for the uh, catches, but for hit wicket, there is no soft signal. Uh, would have been interesting to see what the soft signal was, if there was a soft signal. Uh, but you, as the on-field umpire, um, cannot tell the TV umpire that that is definitely not out. Because if you were 100% sure that it's definitely not out, then you shouldn't be referring the decision. Uh, so yes, there was some communication between the on-field umpires and the TV umpire. Uh, but like I said, it is an opinion law as to when the batter has completed receiving the delivery. And in the opinion of the TV umpire, the batter had not completed receiving the delivery when he put down his wicket. And that is the um, reason that he gave for giving the batter out. Um, but I believe that that particular TV umpire was marked down for that decision by the match referee. I hope that explains, Mervyn. Yes, yes, perfectly. I was just to ask you who the umpire was, but okay, <clears throat> let's keep it at that. Uh, I'm glad that you touched on something that I wanted to ask you. Uh, other information. Yeah, um, now, when I mean with other information is, uh, can you look at perhaps the, the, the body language of, of, of the batter or, or any player? I, I know this comes only with experience and, and the longer you stand, you, you build up that experience. But I think body language plays a huge role in this decision. Uh, what I mean is you could have seen that the, the batter was already in a in a relaxed mode, and there was a huge time lapse before but before he actually hit that wicket. So could have body language played the role here, yeah? and they could have looked at that other information, like you uh, like you said. Mervyn, it's like I said, it's an opinion law, and yes, uh, one of the things that I look for in uh, a lot of decisions that I make is the body language of the batter. Uh, for example, a court behind uh, appeal. Uh, sometimes you don't hear the nick, sometimes you don't see the deviation, and you just have to use all the clues around you to make the decision. Uh, but of course, to uh, give a batter out, we know that you should be uh, 
have a certain amount of um, positivity in terms of knowing that he is out. So you can't just guess and think, oh, th that's a great appeal from the fielding side, so I'm going to give the better out. Uh, definitely uh, try and use the batter's body language uh, and any other clues that you can find. Uh, Abdullah, I've never had a hit wicket um, to deal with myself. I don't know if you have had and what uh, clues you used. Did you check the body language of the batter to make a decision? Also never had a body uh, hit wicket um, decision, uh, Tom. Um, uh, but um, if you need to make it, and yes, it is an opinion law, and a decision you make, you need to be able to to pack it up uh, with uh, with a law or a, a playing condition. Yeah. So whatever side you you go to, and whatever decision you you make, you should be able to back it up. And in terms of Brendan Taylor's uh, not out uh, decision, um, the reason as Olamidi uh, as Olamidi said was uh, the striker has completed his action in receiving uh, receiving the delivery. So I, I'm able to back up my decision with uh, with a law and then no one can 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 fault you fault you on it. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Mervyn, are you okay, happy? And, and, uh, yes, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, uh, one last question. It's with this is with regards to to COVID protocol. Does it still stand or, or not? Uh, the playing conditions for Western Province Cricket Association are being reviewed as we speak, and we will not have any uh, COVID protocols in for the coming season. Uh, the one uh, playing condition that has stayed is the use of saliva is still uh, not allowed to shine the ball. So that is now not considered just a COVID playing condition. It is now considered as a normal playing condition uh, for international cricket and is filtering down to our club cricket. And uh, with regards to that saliva, uh, uh, there's still a, a penalty runs uh, which can be agreed? That's correct. Uh, it still applies first and final, first and final warning at the first uh, incident and if it happens any other subsequent occasions in the match then five penalty runs will be awarded to the batting side and the matter will be reported okay that ball does it need to be replaced then uh, no the ball is not replaced okay cool thank you so much you're welcome Mervin. thank you bavish Panjwani, I don't see any other hands up, so if you've got any more questions, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Yeah, Tom. So consider a condition, there are two wicket keepers in the fielding team and they change it mid-match. So do, we need, do they need to inform someone or they can just do it? Um, Bavesh, if the two wicket keepers are both nominated players in the starting 11, they can change uh, gloves anytime during their fielding innings and as many times as they wish, as long as there is no time wasting involved. Okay. Uh, one more thing, one more question. So uh, I don't know whether in South Africa we use cricket, uh, here we use artificial cricket mats, uh, which uh, are used with nails to fix it in the ground. So what if uh, the ball fall on one of the nails and deflects too much? Um, I'm going to hand that one over to Abdullah. Uh, I don't think we have artificial mats which are nailed to the ground. Abdullah, I'm not sure what you would do in that incident if the ball hits one of those nails. 
Yeah, the uh, yeah we don't have artificial mats um, in South Africa um, that gets nailed down uh, by this. Yes, uh, about 20, 20 to 25 years ago, uh, mats were nailed. I mean, I still played um, in the 90s and early 2000s. We still used the mats that was nailed. Um, uh, but yeah, these days, not anymore. The artificial mats... Um, are let's say glued glued to the um, um, to the piece the piece of um, slab. But to answer your question, the if a mat should be nailed to the to the um, if there should be nails in the mat, that mat are are usually are usually uh, the nails are usually at the at the end of 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 the mat. Um, if you understand what I'm what I'm trying to say. So now, yeah. so because yeah, because the nails are are right at the the end of 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 the of the mat, the um, they've brought in a law um, recently that if the ball pitches off the pitch or or partially off the pitch, umpire to call and signal no ball. So just uh, if I should visualize and I'm uh, looking at at uh, a, a mat, that nail should be right um, um, or hit, hit, um, right at the end of of the pitch. So if the ball should hit one of those nails, I think it should then be partially off the pitch, and you can then protect the batsman by calling and signaling no ball because there is a law that says if it pitches partially or off the pitch. Mm. Um, Either umpire to call and signal no ball. Uh, yeah, that's just my take, Tom. Um, I don't know if you want to add something. I agree with you 100%, Abdullah. Um, I think the word to be used there is the edge of the pitch. And uh, definitely for me, that would be a no ball if it lands on the edge of the pitch or partially off the pitch. Bavesh, are you happy yeah. with that? Yeah, I'm happy with the answer. And that's all from my side. Great stuff. Thanks for the questions, Pavesh. And thanks for the interaction from everybody this evening. I see there's a question in the chat box from Cindy um, relating to the previous question about uh, wicked keepers uh, swapping. And Cindy asks, do they have to be nominated as wicket keepers or can any one of the other nominated players swap with the wicket keeper? Uh, Cindy, uh, typically only one um, player is listed as a wicket keeper on a team sheet, uh, but anybody can keep wicket in the nominated 11. So it does not matter that um, they are not listed as wicket keepers as long as they are listed as a nominated player in the starting 11, they can keep wicket at any time. Ramesh asks if the ball is pitched off the field behind the wicket of the striker, then is it wide or no ball? Uh, Abdullah, uh, you want to take that one? So it pitches off the um, pitch, but it only lands after it has passed the bowling crease. Uh, yes, Tom, I'll take it. Uh, thanks for your question, uh, Ramesh. Um, the 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 noble law states that if a ball pitches um, wholly or partially off the pitch before reaching the striker's wicket. Either umpire or the, the umpire in the best position is the bowlers in the umpire to call and signal no ball. So you you need to judge whether it first uh, the first condition is whether it pitch off the pitch wholly or partially. If the answer to that question is uh, yes, so that's the first part. The second part is uh, did it pitch wholly or partially off in front of the striker's wicket or behind the striker's wicket? If it was in front of the striker's wicket, umpire to call and signal no ball. If it was behind the striker's wicket, call and signal wide ball. Thanks, Tom. 
Hundred percent, Dula. Thank you for that. And I see Bavesh Arya's hand is up. Bavesh, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Abdullah. I do not have a question, but I have a special regards from Mr. Uh, Carl Herter from ICC Empire Coach from South Africa. He was uh, in the uh, Netherlands uh, during the uh, three ODI games of Pakistan, uh, Netherlands versus Pakistan, and we had a small uh, event. Uh, to 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 learn and some advice from him and that time i mentioned about both of you and he gave a special regards to both of you <laughs> thank you very much Bavish. um carl hurt uh, took us uh through the ranks as we were in the cricket south africa uh, pipeline panel as it were uh, the amateur tournaments that we were involved in are to prepare us for uh, professional umpiring. Uh, so we worked quite a few years with Carl Herter and uh, a brilliant umpire coach. And uh, I'm sure you are learning a lot from him as well. And I trust you are learning a fair bit from us. So thank you for those kind words, uh, Bavesh. And thank you all again for your attendance and your input for this evening's um, question and answer session. Once again, well done for all of you answering correctly on that scenario of the hit wicket. Um, huh? Before we close uh, this evening, um, I just want to take you through the exam um, admin and logistics, uh, simply because uh, next week the two lectures are on Monday and Wednesday. I will not be attending. Um, I will be um, taking a face-to-face -face course at a local school here in Cape Town. Uh, so Abdullah will be on his own. Uh, I will repeat all of these logistics on email um, on Sunday, just before sending out the invite for Monday's lecture but I thought, uh, let me talk you through it. And if there are any questions, uh, you can feel them to me um, since I won't be available next week. So the same procedures will apply as for the level two exams, whereby you have the option to write the exam at Newlands Cricket Ground or remotely being watched on Microsoft Teams by myself and Abdullah. Next week, you will have the last two lectures, as mentioned, they will be on Monday the 29th and Wednesday the 31st of August, and then you will have until Monday the 5th of September to pay the exam fee. The exam fee is free for members of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. If you are a member of another umpires association in South Africa, then you need to request to write with them at a venue that suits your head of training. Uh, if you are quite far and cannot organize uh, a sitting at your association, you are welcome to uh, write with us, uh, and that will still be free. Uh, you will write remotely. Uh, just make your head of training aware that you are writing with us. So the way that remote writing works is that I will send on the night before the exam, the first exam sitting is Wednesday, 7th of September at 1800 hours South African time. And the exam is three hours long and it's 120 marks. If you do need more time, we will allow you more time. Uh, but please, it will only be within reason. We're not going to give you four and a half hours to write a three hour paper. We'll give you three and a half hours 
maybe 10 minutes more if you are struggling to finish. Um, but what we will need from you if you are writing remotely is you need to be in a quiet room. You need to have a stable internet connection and you need to have your camera on for the duration of the exam. And then you need to have your microphone on for the duration of the exam so that we can see and hear that you're the only person in the room and you are not uh, using any assistance uh, in terms of checking your law book or reading on your computer um, anything except the question paper. Uh, what we found in level two that works well is uh, we don't email you the question paper. We will be typing the questions on the chat box in the exam. Um, so only those people who have uh, registered for the exam sitting on Wednesday, the 7th of September, will get a Microsoft Teams link to join on Wednesday at 17.50, 10 minutes before the exam is supposed to start. And then at precisely 18.05, I will start copying and pasting the questions uh, from the PDF that I have of the question paper into the chat box. Question one all the way through to question 18. I think there's 18 questions. Um, and what I will do is in case you come in late, I will type all 18 questions once through. Uh, each question will be posted separately, so there'll be 18 different posts and then I will post each question again from 1 to 18. So if you uh, came in late, you can't see questions that were typed before you came into the meeting. So you will be able on the second posting of the questions to read the questions. Um, when I send the meeting invite for the um, people who are writing remotely, I will also send the answer sheet, which is blank, that you need to print out, and you will use that to write your answers. You do not need to write the questions on the answer sheet. You only need to label your answers and then write your answers. So question one and the answer to question one. You write Q2 and the answer to question two. You do not have to start a new page for each answer you can write five answers on one page if it fits when you are finished answering all of the questions and please make sure you answer all of the questions there were a few of you who submitted answer sheets for level two which where you didn't answer all of the questions I'm not sure why um, make sure that all your pages are numbered at the bottom of each answer sheet page, there is a, a space to put in page one of 12, page two of 12, page three of 12, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, make sure that all your pages are numbered, and then you're going to use your phone to take pictures and scans of all the pages. And there are apps. Cam Scanner seems to be the best app that consolidate your 12 pictures into one 12 page PDF. OK, we're not going to be accepting WhatsApp 10, 12 WhatsApp pictures. We want one PDF with all 12 pages that you have written on. And please also include the cover page in your scan. So your cover page has got your name and your details on it. You do not need to write Western province um, on the anywhere. You just need to write your address, whether you are in KwaZulu-Natal, whether you are in Pune in India, whether you are in um, Finland or the Netherlands, write your full address and your email address and also your phone number. There's space for all of that on the front page. If we find problems with your script, then I'll be able to contact you uh, quickly 
uh, to clear up any issues. Um, all of this you will do while you're still in view, still in the same room, and we are making sure that you're not getting any assistance in the whole process. And that is also the only time you're allowed to use your phone. Um, the rest of the time you will only be flicking through the uh, chat box to see the questions. Uh, we do not want to see you on your computer for half of the time because that would raise suspicion of you maybe viewing um, study material on your computer instead of just looking at your computer for the questions. If you do not have a computer, if you do not have a tablet, then yes, you can use your phone to log on to that Teams call, um, but it just means that you're going to have to squint to read the questions. Um, so that is the only uh, problem with using the phone is because the writing of the questions is going to be quite small. And I know that on some people's phones, they can't view the chat box in a Microsoft Teams call. So if you can't view the chat box, unfortunately, uh, you can't write the exam because you won't see the questions. So please make sure during the next two lectures that you can see the chat box and um, make sure that you are able to read the questions in the chat box because that's what you'll be using to read the exams. Um, once you have um, created a PDF, you email it to us and we're going to give you two Gmail addresses, my Gmail address and Abdullah's Gmail address for you to send the answer scripts to and we need to check before you leave the meeting, we need to check that your emails uh, have come through with the attachment and that you have um, your PDF has got all the questions answered and they are legible. Um, these question papers or answer sheets are forwarded to the top six umpires in South Africa for them to mark your uh, answer sheets. You're not going to have the benefit of myself and Abdullah marking. Uh, we know you and we want you to pass. Unfortunately, there are no favors. You need to make life as easy as possible for the marker to get you the 80% that you need to pass the exam. Um, depending on how many of us writing the level three exam, the results should be available within two to three weeks after the second sitting. And if you get between 70 and 79%, then you will be allowed a free rewrite. The date of that rewrite has not yet been confirmed. Um, maybe we won't need a rewrite because everybody passes. Hopefully that will be the case. But uh, once we get the results back, then we will decide whether there's going to be, there is a need for a rewrite or not. And then we will decide on a date if there is a need for the rewrite. Uh, just to conclude on the exam fees, it is free for members of any umpires association in South Africa. It is 200 rands for um, anybody in South Africa that is not a member of an umpires association, and it is 400 rand for everybody outside of South Africa. Uh, they are different payment methods and I have put those on emails uh, previously. I'll put them on again. Uh, if you can't pay by direct uh, transfer on your bank to uh, our bank, then you need to use PayPal and the PayPal details are also on the meeting. That is a very long bit of admin for all of you and it will be repeated on email. I see we've got a couple of hands up, so I'll go back to the hands and I see Julian Thompson, our vice president, has got his hand up. Mr. Vice, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good evening all. Um, thank you, Tom and Abdullah, once again for an awesome uh, presentation of the Level 3 course. Um, Tom, I heard you saying that you're not available on Monday. I know it's, it 
is going to be a challenge for Abdullah to sort out everything on his own. Abdullah, um, I will avail myself to be with you as your sidekick. Like between you and Tom, the one is the sidekick and the one is the, the presenter. So Abdullah, I will be your sidekick on Monday. Thank you, Tom, and have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Vice. Uh, very kind of you to offer your time and services. Uh, next hand up, Mervyn, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. I, with regards to the exams, uh, what are we allowed to take into the exam room? And then secondly, uh, I believe it's on the 7th and the 10th. Um, if you feel that you didn't do well on the 7th, can you rewrite it on the 10th? That is my question. Um, first question, Mervyn, uh, you bring your pen, your ruler and your calculator to the exam room at Newlands. No need to bring any paper because you will be provided with an answer sheet and obviously you're not allowed to bring any study material with you. Or if you do bring along study material to study just before the exam starts, you need to put away your study material in a bag um, and obviously not refer to it at any time in those three hours that you're writing the exam. And then the second question, uh, please remind me what it was, Mervyn. Uh, it's with regards to the, 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 the days of the exam. Is it the 7th and the 10th? The 7th is a Wednesday uh, yeah. from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. and the 10th is a Saturday from 9 a.m. to midday. Okay. Uh, both of them at uh, Newlands and today it's been confirmed the media center at Newlands. Okay, uh, now, yes. Now the question was if you if you feel that you didn't do well on the 7th, Say for instance, I feel I didn't do well in the seventh. Can I can I come back on the tenth? Uh, no, Mervin, you mm -hmm. cannot do that. You you choose one of those sittings, and uh -huh. you, you need to write to the best of your ability in one of them. Your paper will be marked. It won't be marked before the tenth if you write on the seventh. Uh -huh. And like I said, if you get between seventy and seventy nine percent, then you will be allowed a rewrite. Uh, probably late September. Uh, if you get below 70%, then you need to repeat the course uh, next year, April, I think we're having level three again. Thank you, I'm clear about that. Great stuff. Okay. Ladies and gents, apologies to have kept you so long this evening. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, because I won't be with you next week, for those two lectures, I'm going to take this opportunity to wish you well in your level three exam. I'm sure you'll all do very well in the capable hands of Abdullah for Monday and Wednesday's lectures. And now with Julian helping out even better. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and weekend when it comes. Thank you and good night. Good night. Uh, good night, everyone. Bye.